We want to welcome you this morning, everyone that has joined us for this session today, Gambling in the Latino Communities. My name is Kelly Gage, and I work for the Department of Human Services. I'm the Program Manager for Gambling Treatment Services in our office, and I have the pleasure of introducing you to our uh, moderator, or uh, not our moderator, but our host, our uh, presenter this morning. So I want to introduce uh, to you Victor Ortiz, for those who have not had the opportunity to meet him. I will share his bio and then he'll go right into the workshop. Please feel free to drop questions in the chat box or the um, question and answer section and we'll get to those shortly. So Victor Ortiz is a social worker with over 25 years of experience in the development of programs and services in the area of addiction, youth development, child welfare, and behavioral health. He has worked extensively with a wide range of populations, especially in addressing health disparities, promoting equity and social justice. And Victor is a nationally recognized speaker, trainer, and educator in the areas of addiction, gambling disorder, health disparities, and equity. Victor is currently the director of the Office of Problem Gambling Services at the Massachusetts Department of Public Health. Please join me in welcoming Victor Ortiz. You're in for a treat. Thank you. Thank you so much for that introduction. Uh, first of all, before I begin, thank you so much um, to the wonderful state of Illinois for the invitation. I want to give a special thanks to Asia, to Kelly for the introduction, and just a really a team of folks who have been worked really, um, really um, hard to pull uh, this summit together. And I'm really just grateful just to uh, be a part of it. And I really appreciate the opportunity to present on this topic. So I'm going to shift right now and put my slides up and then we can get things started. Um, so before I begin, I want to be able to you know, really fulfill my ethical obligation and state that neither I or any one of my family uh, have any conflicts of interest as it relates to this particular topic. You heard Kelly uh, in the introduction um, state that on a full-time basis, I serve as the director of the Office of Problem Gambling Services for the Massachusetts Department of Public Health. But in full disclosure, I am not here under, um, under um, that, um, under, I, I'm not here under uh, that title and or um, duties. So again, I'm, I want to state that there is no conflict in regards to this presentation. In addition, I'm, because we're virtual, um, you know, we continue to be virtual. Um, we all face challenges when it comes to this virtual platform, although it's a great benefit. Um, I also want to state that my wonderful dog, Chewy, is somewhere in this house. And so, he at times you hear might be bark. Um, I, I, I'm really gotten to the point now where I realize that I think he wants to be part of these se seminars and workshops uh, because he only acts up only when I'm presenting. So I don't know what it's about. I, I assume that I think he just wants to be a part of it. But again, if you hear him, just you know, know that that's Chewy in the background, um, just you know, acting up a little bit. Um, so this topic, when uh, this topic that I want to get into, I want to state first before we start really diving in that I'm going to speak for the next to about 11 o'clock or so. Folks can begin as they hear me speak on different um, aspects of this topic. If there's questions that folks have or comments, please put them in the chat. Uh, Kelly is going to hang out with me and she's going to monitor the chat, things of that nature. So if folks have questions, please pull them in there. And um, by 11 o'clock or so, I'll pause, I'll stop, and then we'll dedicate about 10 minutes or so for you know, questions and answers. Please be advised that as part of this summit, there's going to be a round table um, discussion where myself and Dr. Tim Fong are gonna be hosting 
uh, conversations and having discussions as it relates to not only this topic, but his presentation that will be focusing on the Asian American community. Um, so that should be a treat. I've known Dr. Tim Fong for a long time, a great individual. Um, and so again, there will be that opportunity as well, just so that folks are aware. So let's get right into it. So the question that I get asked all the time by folks is saying, um, why is this topic relevant and important to problem gambling services and care? And at the core of this is that we must understand the Latinx communities within its historical, historical and life context. And that is important in order to inform prevention, intervention, treatment, and recovery services. So that element is critical information that helps us to shape those response. Additionally, research indicates that a one size fits all approaches are ineffective. And additionally, lastly, is a statement that I have been making now for quite some time, um, is that the field of problem gambling has historically been disconnected to the community level experience of gambling and communities of color. So when we think about these three points, really gives us the basis to thinking about why is this topic important? In addition, as a field and as a collective, we state that our goal is to mitigate harms associated with gambling. And if that is the case, then this perspective that we're providing today is critical to our efforts. And I will demonstrate that more as we go along. Now, you know, one of the things that I have consistently been sharing all over the country for quite some time is that in order for us to know where we're going, we have to understand our past. And in order to begin that process, we must think about the history of gambling and expansion in this country. Now, there is a lot of information that's out there that will give us context to that history, that will give us information to that history. But the one that I think summarizes it the best is what has been coined the, uh, the three waves of gambling uh, coined by gambling law expert I. Nelson Rose. And he talks about these three waves and these three waves have significance in the um, expansion of gambling in this country. Um, and, and I think it's a really good way for us to digest and categorize that evolution. But I also you know, would state and theorize uh, to his great work that currently as we speak, we are in the fourth wave of gambling in our country. And I believe that this fourth wave is the most critical wave of all waves. This wave is a significant wave towards, towards us understanding not only what's happening currently in our society uh, as it relates to gambling, but the challenges that we have in front of us. So what is the fourth wave? What is this fourth wave about? One is that the gambling environment is evolving. That the days of the gambling environment being the brick and mortar environments in which people would have to take time and go out to a physical casino, that that environment is now becoming less of a reality because the second point is that technology initiatives and creations are growing. The mere fact that I can do this workshop from my home to in the state of Illinois and surrounding states really speaks to that tech modern, uh, modernization and advancements in technology. In addition, we see um, through uh, really a, an advancement in technology and advertisement. 
the days of having advertisement that is centered around billboards or just a newspaper or things of those mediums are no longer the case. There's an evolution that has happened in advertisement where artificial intelligence is used to be able to do more specific targeted advertisement to specific individuals based on patterns of buying or engaging or whatever the case may be. And in addition, there has been this growing conversation about gaming versus gambling and this sort of sort of connection and, 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 and overlay with one versus the other. And again, that is an evolving space that's happening in our, in, our, in, our, in our field. We see that gambling has become even more of a perceived as even more important source of public and even private revenues. And the last two are where the challenges and opportunities come that's related to this particular topic is that marginalized communities and health disparities now must be at the table in order for us to think about the issues are related to gambling. No longer can we um, not bring this topic to the table. I would say that not only do we need to bring it to the table, but it must be central to all responses as it relates to problem gambling. And additionally, our research has advanced enough that really outlines clearly the complexities and associated to other related issues. The days of thinking about problem gambling in isolation, independent from other health issues, in particular addiction and mental health, those days are over. We must think about gambling and the interconnection of both mental health and substance abuse in order for us to be able to move this work forward. So that combination of points is what I conclude is the fourth wave and is the most critical wave of all waves that we're experiencing right now in our society. Now, to that extent, it's important to note that within our field right now, the dominant theme that we hear the dominant um, ideology that is promoted um, within the field that you hear it in the mainstream is a term called responsible gambling. And let me be clear, responsible gambling uh, is informed by what is known as the Reno model. And in the Reno model, there are some positive elements. For example, in the uh, responsible gambling and its theory, there is quite a language that really is centered around consumer protection. And that's a positive. There's also a need to really speak to the development of evidence established in the Reno model. And also in the, in the Reno model, there is a really a sort of call for the engagement of stakeholders. So as all things, this is a, an ideology that in theory, there are some really good pieces here. But in practice, there is a conversation that needs to be had in regards to saying, let's take a look at what is happening within our field in regards to practice, because there is a, a significant need of improvement in a lot of these specific areas. So what are the downsides of responsible gambling, even from its theoretical as well as its practice? One is one size does not fit all. So when we think about some of the practice that is happening around responsible gambling or even some of the embracing of it, we must really challenge others and say, wait a minute, one size does not fit all. People do not get into problems related to gambling because they don't know the odds of a slot machine or things of that nature. So again, we must think critically about the fact that one size does not fit all. Second, who is really responsible is a question that has arise and it has merit and we should not dismiss it. In practice, what is happening is that the term responsible gambling is giving this impression that the individual is responsible. 
Yet in turn, the, the, the folks who are the creators of the theory say, well, we never intended that to be the case. We intended that there is a collective shared responsibility, but yet in the practice and the way it plays out, gives the impression that the person is responsible for whatever occurs. And again, we must give serious thought to that uh, as well. Communities of color are often not engaged and overlooked. In practice, what we see, what I see often is that we turn around and create the strategies and then we put a person of color on a brochure or things of that nature and think that that is the extent of promoting equity and or diversity within the context of responsible gambling. Yet we're not engaged in the early stages. We're not engaged in the development. And that in itself needs, there's a lot of room for improvement when it comes to this ideology of responsible gambling. Now, to that extent, I had the privilege with a colleague of mine and a good friend of mine, Dr. Hane Hernandez, to contribute to a book that recent uh, that was written, I would say at least two years ago now. Uh, wow, time does fly. On the book was uh, primary uh, pr responsible gambler gambling, uh, primary stakeholders perspectives, and we had a, a, a really uh, the pleasure of contributing a chapter on public health and social justice consideration to inform research policy and practice where more details that we take to task and give our perspective with those lens as it relates to responsible gambling. Now, in addition, when we think about gambling research um, to, set, to continue to set the stage, we know that problem gambling, uh, that over 90% of individuals who identify as problem gamblers have had a pre-existing mental health or substance related disorder prior to the onset of the gambling disorder. And this again is evidence that shows the intersectionality between gambling, substance abuse and mental health. In Massachusetts, there is a data point that I don't think gets as, as much, um, it's not talked about enough. And that is in Massachusetts, we, we saw that in regards to individuals who are recreational gamblers. Now, let me pause there for a second. The recreational gamblers are gamblers who oftentimes the industry and others see this group as free from risk or less risk from developing a, uh, a problem with gambling and or um, a gambling disorder. And that is what's been promoted in our field for years, right? These are recreational gamblers, no harm, things of that nature. Hence, this activity is safe. But yet when we put a public health lens on recreational gamblers, what we see is that recreational gamblers are more likely to be obese, smoke heavily, use alcohol and use prescription drugs. So again, when we put a public health lens on this, we see that those recreational gamblers, a good percentage of them have these other related risk areas. So in addition, when we think about the research tells us that the prevalence rate of disordered gambling among blacks, native and Asian Americans are higher than whites. In regards to Latinos, it's not very well understood in regards to that, in regards to that prevalence. And it is because research, as well as when we talk about that historical disconnect of the community experience and communities of color, that's not just in the programmatic element, that's also in the research as well. So the question becomes, what is the cause of this health disparity? Because this research is clear. This research is showing us that there's certain segments, cultural groups that are disproportionately uh, impacted by gambling, then, then they're higher than whites. So the cause, so what is the cause of this health disparity? So when we, 
start to really wrestle with that, we must first think from a policy perspective. And let's look at our history. Because there's a lot that we can learn and we can extract from our history. And let's look at an example. Let's look at the war on drugs. This national policy was aimed at mitigating drug addiction and our country. But what we've come to understand that the policy of the war on drugs using um, tactics to incarcerate individuals and take punitive actions against uh, individuals, either possession, distribution, or any engagement of drugs created a significant rise in incarceration. And so we've come to understand that in our society in general terms, the United States makes up about 5% of the world's population. Yet we are 25% of the world's prison population. And the majority of individuals incarcerated are black and brown folks. We've seen that from a period of time when we take a look at the rate only on the federal prison side, the high rates of incarceration has increased over this period of time. And again, when we take a look at that failed policy, what has been the consequences of such a failed policy on black and brown communities, right? If we were to do this in healthcare, we see significant disparities among Latinos, African-Americans and other communities as it relates to healthcare. We, we, if we do that in education, we see great disparities in regards to education. Keep in mind what I mentioned, we cannot separate gambling from these realities of disparities whether it's in healthcare, education, failed federal policy, all of these issues have a relationship with each other. We know that Hispanic population, United States lives, uh, one in five lives in poverty, a rate six times higher than the national average. So these are the critical points to move us away from thinking about gambling in this narrow context to thinking about a much broader context to think about the intersectionality of gambling and all of these realities that we see in our society and really beginning to understand and piece this together. Now, how do we begin to address health disparities and problem gambling? Well, the first thing that we must do is begin to really uh, think about a public health approach. Now, this is where I speak to many of my colleagues and say that again, the dominant theme in our field is responsible gambling. And there's no knock on my folks who do that work. That work needs to be hap that needs to happen in, in many contexts, especially in, in, in relationship to the industry. But let's be clear. That work is very narrow. And so we must move from a narrow focus to a much wider focus in thinking about public health. In particular, when we look at public health, one of the key fabrics of public health is the social determinants of health. Now, why is this critical and important? Because we understand by definition that the social determinants of health are the conditions in which people are born, where they grow, where they live, where they work and age. And these circumstances are shaped by the distribution of money, power and resources at a global, national and local level. These social determinants of health is critical to health outcomes. In particular, when we look at the social determinants of health, 
There are five pillars that really make up the social determinants of health. And it is also within the social determinants of health where we see the greatest levels of inequities. When we look at the social determinants of health, we see the categorizations, but you look underneath the categorization. And for example, if you look at economic stability, you see poverty, employment, food security, housing stability, and so on and so on. And if you were to do an exercise to say, what is the relationship of gambling to, sub, to not only the categories, but even the subcategories, you would find many relational elements here. And it would challenge us to then think about how do we begin with this new shift of thinking, with a more expansive way of thinking, a strategies to mitigate harms associated with gambling. Now, why, Victor, you know, you talk about these social determinants of health. Why is this even important to gambling? And it is important to gambling because we understand by research that over 90% of health outcomes are rooted in the social determinants of health. And this is why I say it, health outcomes are not pre predicated on your genetic code, but it is determined based on your zip code. And these environments are critical to health. These are the facts. This is the research. Now, here comes the challenge to us. If this is the case because the research is clear, then I go back to my responsible gambling people. And I say to them, help me to square this up. Because if our tactics in responsible gambling is talking about things like from, um, talking about the odds of a slot machine or using financial literacy or self-exclusion, help me to understand <laughs> how do you square this up because you can't. And I'm not saying that there's no value in that, but understand the narrowness of that focus. Because people don't get transitioned from recreational stages of gambling to problems and or disorder gambling because they lack understanding of a slot machine. Just being clear here, it is time for us to tackle this issue from a public health perspective and expand the lens to begin to have fruitful and meaningful conversations to advance this work. So now let's take a look at health disparities. Health disparities are factors that influence the social economic position of individuals and group within industrial society and also influences their health. We all understand that the social economic conditions of the places where people live, their work have an even more substantial influence on health than personal social economic position. And so according to Healthy People 2020, health disparities should be understood as a particular type of health differences that is closely linked with social, economic, or environmental disadvantages. And so we have to ask ourselves, how did these disadvantages occur and why? And I understand that this is the hard work, but this is the work that has to happen if we collectively want to be able to work together to mitigate harm associated with gambling. Now, here's the kicker, because when I speak to this, I have many of my wonderful colleagues who work in the responsible gambling space and other spaces who come to me and trying to, you know, um, follow along and trying to see uh, the relationship here, but here's the key relationship. We understand that educational attainment and income provides the, psycho the psychosocial and material resources that protect against the exposure of health risk in early and adult life. Persons with low level of education income generally experience increased rates of many health-related issues. 
So let me pause there for a second. Here's how, how we square this up with gambling. Do you know that the two major risk factors of gambling that transition people from recreational stages of gambling to problem stages of gambling to even disorder gambling is low educational attainment and income? Hello? Hello? Let's think about that for a second. If we understand this through the research that has been conducted and gambling, that the two major risk factors that drive people from recreational stages to problem stages or even this, um, gambling disorders is these two risk factors. Well, guess what? These are the same two risk factors that if they're elevated, can not only mitigate the harm associated with gambling, but would in, and protect individuals and communities against the exposure to health risk. This is why we need to immediately move into a more of a public health approach as it relates to problem gambling. Now, let's look at some data. I'm looking at the time, just keeping track of time here. We, when we look at the NISARC study, we see that there's a high correlation. Again, just to reiterate the emphasis on the data, tells us there's a high correlation of substance use to gambling as well as mental health. These numbers are not light numbers. These numbers are overwhelmingly high numbers that really solidify the intersectionality of problem gambling to both substance abuse and mental health. Now, in this last 15 minutes before I open it up for questions, I wanna move now and do a community profile exercise of a city in Massachusetts, Springfield, Massachusetts, which is on the western side of the state of Massachusetts, where currently is home to one of the new casinos in Massachusetts. Please bear in mind that this is an exercise. And the data that I'm going to share is from 2000 to 2010. This data has been updated, obviously, but it's only being used for the purpose of an exercise to really tie in the points that I have been making um, this morning. Now, when we look at the Springfield population, we see that the Springfield population is about 38 to almost 40% Latinos. And it's what you call a majority minority community when you combine it with other groups as well. What you see of a period of 10 years, from 2000 to 2010, you see that Latinos have moved into Springfield and whites have moved out of Springfield. And you see the change in the numbers. If you take a look at Latinos in regards to the labor force, and we get, remember, those two critical uh, risk factors. Please keep those in mind as I go through this. We see that in the, in the labor force, that Latinos represent over 55% of the total workforce, 16 to 64, second lowest among all population. We see that Latinos represent 20, over 20% 20 rate of unemployment, highest among all population. When we take a look at health, we see that Latinos rank within the highest in regards to obesity, asthma, diabetes, HIV diagnosis, and cancer. When we then switch over to education, keep in mind, once again, think about those risk factors. We see that Latinos make up 58% of the school population. And we see that Latinos represent a 49%, a little bit over 49% graduation rate, lowest among all populations. And I'm sure that if we did this exercise in the different communities that you're interested in, I would, I would say that, fair to say, that you will find similar results in different locations. 
So it's important for us to take this public health approach and really look at these important data points in the community as we think about what are the strategies that we want to be able to implement. Now, here's some key points. We know that there are millions of people in the United States that experience individualized and, and systemic discrimination based on race, ethnicity, social economic status, age, sex, disability status, sexual orientation, gender identity, and residential location, right? So we know this goes across many areas. And so the question becomes that I get asked all the time as we transition to this, uh, to this phase of the workshop, the question I get asked all the time is, Victor, how do we build equity? You've done a great job explaining the disparities. I've outlined that argument for you. But how do we build equity? How do we transition to building equity? Well, number one is key, what I've reiterated multiple times here today, is that we must start with a public health approach, right? And that understanding the connection between the social, cultural, and economic factors that influence the spread of a, of a, of a, of a disorder, and in this case, we're talking about gambling, right? So we must move first to a public health response as part of building equity. Now, I use this illustration all the time when we talk about building equity because oftentimes people, um, you know, words are really powerful, and people, we might not all be on the same page in regards to um, terminology. And if you see by this illustration, you see that, you know, we see that in one side, you see equality where the distribution of resources is the same across, across the board. But even if you spread the resources across the board, you still see that there is disadvantages, right, based on the height of the individuals who are standing on the boxes. And on the far other end, you see the realities that we experience in our society. We oftentimes give higher the resources to those that are experiencing great advantages versus the realities of others. So equity is in the middle, which means that we must think about the redistribution of resources to those that are in greater need, right? Um, and that is, the way that we need to begin to think about uh, this work. Now, when we think about building equity, um, we must think critically that building health equity is not about providing every individual with the same type of service or simply treating individuals or entire community as the same. I would say that's ineffective. Instead, building health equity requires that policymakers, responsible gambling program developers, program treatment providers and healthcare systems strive to understand the specific and collective needs of individuals and entire community. And that is our challenge that we have is to be able to understand uh, that in its totality. To address racial and ethnic disparities and build health equity, we must among other things, understand the role of culture, cultural humility, and culture intelligence. Let me spend a minute there. I see myself in the many years that I've been doing this work as a lifelong learner, and I'm grateful for that journey. And hum cultural humility requires for me and for all of us to look inward because we're not a finished product, to continue to learn and grow. But cultural intelligence really creates an empowerment element to understand that many groups have significant intelligence within the culture and the setting of the culture that we can learn from. That, and that's why I state that we must be able to bring that to the table and learn and, and, and have uh, that, those opportunities. So now let me just spend a second here really quickly. This is the health impact pyramid that is put out by the CDC. 
And here, just, just to reiterate the point, you know, most of the work in our fields, most of the work in our field, including responsible gambling methods, um, are, um, are in that higher point of the pyramid, right? Either the interventions or the counseling and education. And these are the least effective strategies, although important, but they're the least effective strategies in order to have impact. And so in order for us to have impact, it goes back to the points of addressing those inequalities that we talk about, as well as changing those educational and economic realities that our people um, experience. So here's promoting equity um, that we can think about, food for thought, as we sort of come to the tail end of this particular presentation. And then we're going to open it up for questions. Um, so bear with me for a few more minutes, and then we will do that. From an organizational perspective, I want us to think about recruitment and retention. Think about professional developments or trainings and mentorship being offered at your organization as it relates to promoting equity. What does the governance look like in regards to leadership and boards of directors? You know, it's interesting. Oftentimes I get people call me or um, speak to me or meet with me in regards to their efforts. And when I take a look at the, their workforce and the staffing structure, they will say, Victor, we have great diversity in our organizations. But when I look clearly in the breakdown of who's where and what, you see a significant disparity in regards to that workforce. And so it's critical that we must not just move away from diversity standards in organizations and move to equity standards. And, and that's a whole different element, which means that we take a look at who's on your board of directors, who's in leadership, who's in middle management, right? Those are the areas that we need to move into in regards to equity standards versus diversity standards. In regards to programs and services, those of us that are in, in the audience and run programs, you know, development of community engagement strategies. I'm proud to say that, you know, it's been my training and my work that any, any work or any initiatives that I had the pleasure of leading or being a part of starts with engaging folks locally. That's important. Partnership and collaboration is a cornerstone of public health. We can't do this work by ourselves. And the other thing is that we got to come out of our bubbles and our circles, and we have to engage and support communities and cultural events in order to continue to live, I mean, to, to learn and also uh, build relationships at the local level. Um, a, a few more thoughts. Language. We must think about these concepts that I raised, right? Um, and, and really give some, some thought to that and we're gonna reframe some of these concepts. Self-promoting labels. I'm not sure what has happened over the last two years, but I have seen this really significant increase in our field of people labeling themselves as experts. What, the, what does that mean? You know, and I just think that that just, how can we say, oh, I'm an expert and promote yourself an expert, then simultaneously come out and say, oh yeah, I also promote equity. Where's the humility, right? If I'm an expert, that means that I have, I have some higher level of knowledge than you do. That's what we're promoting and we need to reframe that. I am a lifelong learner. Yes, my responsibility is here to facilitate this particular workshop. That's my responsibility. But I'm no expert. I come here as a learner and I learn as I every day I'm blessed to learn. So we shouldn't, we should stop using those self-promoting labels and promoting one's agenda. We must be open to learning and listen. Create space for dialogue and exchange. And, and additionally, one of the things about the renal model that they talk about is this engagement of stakeholders, but what they did not mention is what is the balance of power in that room? Right, because that's in that circle, and we must give critical thought of the balance of power in those in the dynamics within those within that engagement. Um, here are some points that are raised by Brian Stevenson, who talks about the four keys to increase justice. Um, if you have not seen his work, Brian uh, has dedicated his entire life to uh, 
mass incarceration and social justice as it relates to mass incarceration. Um, he has a, a great book that he's written and it, it escapes me uh, at this moment, the name of the book, but if you Google his name, um, the book I highly recommend it. It's a great, great book. Um, I know there's a movie that came out as part of the book, but I recommend the book first uh, before the movie. Um, so anyway, Brian Stevenson uh, talks about these four pieces, right? He talks about get proximate to communities in need. We, we got to, you know, get connected to communities. Uh, tell the truth to change the narrative. Be hopeful. We're in the hope business. And despite of the challenges that we have in our field, in our society, we're in the hope business and we also not only see challenges, but we see opportunities. And the mere fact that I can sit here today and have this conversation today, because yesterday this conversation was not happening. So we have to be hopeful. Do the uncomfortable and inconvenient things. I always say to folks that when doing that, I do this presentation that my goal is not to make us comfortable. I had this wonderful professor who said to me, comfort is not the goal. So there might be aspects of this that might've made you feel a little bit uncomfortable. But we must do the uncomfortable and inconvenient things in order to promote change. Last, uh, as I wrap this up, I just want to say that, you know, community engagement is important. You know, the subjective experience of people at the local level is critical to our understanding. And, and it creates a pathway to empowerment, right? Um, here's some resources that you might want to take a look at. As a from both SANSA and the Office of Minority Health, if you're interested in this topic in regards to you know how to implement um, these elements that I discussed in your organization, or to give some more critical thought, there is many tools um, that are that exist that have been put out by SAMHSA, the Office of Minority Health, that you can uh, take a look at. Um, lastly, I just want to close with this statement. Um, you know, Brian Stevenson says that. You know, we cannot create healthier communities and healthier societies if we're not brave enough to get uncomfortable. We need good people to position themselves in difficult places. So I say this in closing, I am so grateful for uh, my colleagues of color in this field who have labored for a long time, including my wonderful sister, uh, Dr. Deborah Haskins um, from the great state of Maryland, who I've presented many times with her, even in this setting, a uh, great sister who for years labored in this space. Um, and I know both her struggles. Um, and so I'm grateful that as our field continues to grow, the representation also grows and to see um, the work continue. So with that, I wanna say, Thank you. And you have here my email that if there's anything that pops up that you feel later on, you want to ask me a question, please do so. Or um, also you can follow me on Twitter with Victor underscore Ortiz 21, um, which is my Twitter handle. With that, I'll turn it over to Kelly. And thank you so much for the opportunity for hanging out with you um, this morning. And also the, the dog did not bark, which is a accomplishment. I don't think that's ever happened. Anyway, Kelly, I'll turn it over to you, sis. Thank you, Victor. What a wonderful presentation. And you always enlighten us to want to do more and, and to, to ask the question, what can I do to do more, to be involved in, in helping to, as you stated, expand the lens. So you had a couple of questions that came in. The first one that came in um, was from William or Bill, and Bill asked, what additional prevention measures can be undertaken to reduce the harm of gambling issues within specific populations of persons? And then I'll have one other for you. Great. So no, thank you for the thank you for the questions. What I would state is that the it's imperative that when we think about prevention, there are two things that are really important in prevention. Number one, by definition, prevention is defined in these two categories. One about changing personal attributes, right? But also changing environmental conditions. And oftentimes in our field, what we focus is on that changing in an individual attributes by providing education awareness. And that's important. But if we're going to do prevention, we have to be able to do the totality of the definition, meaning we have to do the 
harder work, which is those changing those environmental conditions. And so um, first we have to embrace the, the total definition of prevention. Second, in order to embrace the total definition of prevention, we also have to have a comprehensive strategy. So for example, in Massachusetts, you know, we have conducted community engagement strategies as a starting point. That allows, we engaged over 1,400 individuals at the local level. That's key, and we continue to engage. Two, that has informed our prevention programming. We have a whole host of prevention programming across looking at youth and older adults, youth and, and, and caregivers, older adults, and various other groups, right? And then lastly, it's all supported by technical assistance and capacity as well as evaluation. So that comprehensive framework allows for prevention to happen. So the days of trying to do prevention by simply doing a sort of like a, a hand tied behind your back and you're doing like, oh, you just wanna do like this education element with youth. That in itself is not gonna get the job done. It's great that's happening. And I understand that funding becomes a challenge in many settings, I get that. But we must think about embracing the total definition of prevention as well as having this comprehensive approach that encompasses all of those elements in order for us to, um, to, be, to be effective. Excellent, thank you, Victor, for that, ex that uh, response to that question. The other question comes from Peter, and Peter asks, how can I be a better benevolent servant to my clients? Some of that I think you've captured already, but that was the last question that we have. Yeah, I mean, look, I'm, that's a great question. This is about, we're in the whole business, you know, and, and I always tell people that the folks that we're working with, whether it's in the preventive space, intervention or treatment or recovery supports, we're in the whole business. And so I think that being genuine, being transparent is important. Um, you know, oftentimes we, you know, we have to, not oftentimes, we have to consistently work on ourselves on our own biases, our own misconceptions, our own stereotypes, and we're all a work in progress, right? So we have to continue um, to really um, develop that, the, the continued strive for the empathy around people's experiences. And this is why, you know, I'm a, I consider myself a hybrid. I'm a preventionist, but I'm also a, a clinic, I have a clinical background. So I consider myself a hybrid and, you know, I, I, I subscribe a lot to Carl Rogers' work in person-centered uh, theory, right? That it's really about um, trying to understand the subjective experience that people go through. And um, the more that we can attend to folks' uh, subjective experience, um, the better we can be, we can develop those, uh, those therapeutic alliances uh, to be able to help and support people through their journey. Victor, thank you so much. Um, we don't have any other questions and we do have a few minutes here before we go for break. Sure. But I wanna ask, about, wanna ask about how to engage the family of individuals who may be struggling with gambling disorder um, in the community, uh, Latino community. How do you engage family members into the services? Oh man, Kelly, that's a that's a that's a hell of a question. We might need more than six minutes to answer that question, but it's a beautiful question. It's a beautiful question. I would say, I would I would if you if you allow me to I expand the question to say how we engage families in general, right? Because I think that we have to understand and accept, not understand and accept, but that when we think about gambling, it's referenced as the hidden addiction, right? So for family members who have just like you know folks who have uh, family members who have family members who have used drugs and alcohol, there, there is a lot of pain in, in, in knowing or experiencing uh, that impact. In this case, we're talking about gambling on the family. And so you're going to experience, and I ask people to have tolerance around the frustrations and even the projections of frustrations, anger, anxiety, based on that experience. And I would say that as simple as it may seem, is that what family members need, including Latino families, is space to express, right? I would say to us, hold ourselves back from thinking 
uh, that we need to have a solution in the moment. We need to have a response in the moment. By just merely creating a space to listen and to acknowledge their truth, acknowledge their experience, allows this valid to, to validate what they're experiencing. One of the difficult things I hear from many families is navigating our system for help is, I mean, it's just, it's just hell for people, right? So I think that what turns a lot of people off is when we have this superficial um, empathy, for lack of better words, and then try to refer people through the system that, you know, and, and that's really unjust in many different ways. And so we, we have to be able to create space to, to listen and validate, to acknowledge the truth of their experience and the challenges and just being really truthful to people. Now, with Latino folks, you know, there's a, a cultural symbolism, a cultural characteristic that's important in Latino families because by definition, uh, families are central to identity, to one's identity, right? So understand that when we talk about that, that what, what that, what that might look like, understand that there's a lot there to unpack because we see ourselves and our identity through the existence and the connections to our family. So when we say that one member of our family is sick, we're all sick, right? We all don't feel well. And so that connection is critical. So understand that uh, we have to allow for a space um, to, to listen, and to learn and to be authentic um, around that. I mean, I hear people tell me all the time, oh, Victor, man, you know, we need to educate Latinos about gambling risk and this and that. We come with our own agenda. I'm like, oh, it's, slow down, man. There's, a lot, there's stuff that happens in Latino communities. I mean, you come to my house on a cookout in the, in the summer. I mean, I got family back here, people playing dominoes and, you know, I'm playing, you know, I'm, my wife is African American. We've out there playing spades. I mean, this happens, but there's a culture element to our. Family. You, I just can't come in with my flip chart here and talk about risk of gambling. And my, they're gonna, they're gonna, you know. So there's ways to educate within the context of not disrupting those cultural flows that are important to who we are and what we do. So thanks, Kelly. A great wow, that, phenomenal question. Thank you so much for expanding on that and expounding on that rather. That's that's a workshop in itself, truly. Yes, it is. So, that's a work. Yes, it is. Yes. <laughs> well, I want to thank you again, Victor, for your time this morning. I know we're going to hear from you a little bit later, you and Dr. Fong on a panel or um, a breakout for lunch, but I wanted to share with those who are have joined us. Thank you for participating in your questions today. I do wanna say that we will uh, take a break, a 10 minute break. And so what we'll ask you to do is to uh, close out of this window and then return to the session access page for the next session that you'll be going to. And uh, we'll see you in 10 minutes. It's now 11.09. And so Victor, again, thank you so much for all that you do um, and for being a part of this second annual summit in Illinois. Oh, thank you. Thank you for the invitation. And thank you for those that were in attendance and took their time to kind of hang out with us for this morning. I really appreciate it. Yes. All right, thank you. All right.